Okay, so for me, it's really a pleasure to introduce uh, Abel Lopez Garcia <clears throat> from the University of Central Florida. Abel uh, got, well, he has actually two PhD, one in Carlos Ter Universidad Carlos III de Madrid in mathematical engineering, and another in 2009, and another in, in, in Vanderbilt University. And uh, he got his BS at the uh, Universidad Complutense de Madrid and, uh, and has a postdoc research fellow at the uh, Catholic University of, of Lubin. I don't know how you pronounce that. Well, he has more than uh, uh, He's a young promise in, in the area of orthogonal polynomials. That's uh, already. 17 papers and uh, two already sent. Um, he has uh, 13 contributed talks, conference, and several others uh, in colloquiums like this one. Uh, and uh, actually, he is a, a, he's a second generation mathematician because his father is, uh, is one of the most important. Cuban mathematician in the area of orthogonal polynomial too. So, uh, as in, there is a say in Spanish, uh, son of cat, chase mouse. <laughs> 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 so, well, I, I know a very long, long time ago. And uh, it's really a pleasure and a satisfaction having him here uh, talking about uh, uh, the an excursion into the theory of multi orthogonal polynomials. Thank you, Wilfredo. Thanks so much for for the invitation, and uh, I'm very glad to to share some mathematics with you. Uh, so um, so in what I will do is, um, in the first uh, 20 minutes or so of my talk, I will talk about orthogonal polynomials, which is a, a very old subject, but, but still nowadays uh, it's, a, it's an area of very intensive research. And uh, there are many, many applications of orthogonal polynomials now, uh, I would say to every branch of analysis, you, you can find orthogonal polynomials and even in other areas. For example, um, recently there are even works where uh, some problems in projective geometry uh, are studied uh, using orthogonal polynomials. So, so it's, a, it's a very, uh, it's old, an old subject, but very, very beautiful, fascinating. And, and then, um, so in the, in the last, 30 minutes or so of my talk, I will move to, to multi-orthogonal polynomials, which, which are a very natural generalization of orthogonal polynomials. So instead of, instead of just one measure or weight defining the orthogonality conditions, we have now several measures, two or more, you know? But, uh, but this, this other area uh, really started to, to be developed in, in a systematic way in the uh, in the last 50 years or so starting starting with the with the work of um, Soviet mathematicians in the school of approximation theory and so that's that's the plan so um, so I'm going to let me okay. Yeah, so, so I'll start uh, then uh, giving you the definition of orthogonal polynomials on the real line. They can be studied in other, in other sets, but I would restrict to, to, to the real line. So, so what I need is, uh, is a positive measure mu on the real line. Uh, and I will assume that the support of the measure contains infinitely many points. The support of the measure is the smallest closed set where the, the measure lives, okay? And because I want all polynomials to be integrable, I 
I need to assume that all the moments of the measure mu are finite. Okay. So if you are not so familiar with the with the concept of measure, you can think that I am always integrating with a certain function w of x. And certainly in, in the most important applications, the measures are, are given by functions, w of x. For example, uh, the Gaussian weight, which Wilfredo likes very much uh, on the whole real line and uh, the Jacobi weight on the interval minus one, one. Yeah. Um, so then you, you consider the, the space of all square integrable functions with respect to the measure mu with the standard in a product. And then a, a sequence PN of polynomials is said, is said to be a sequence of orthogonal polynomials associated with the measure mu. If the degree of PN equals n for all n and PN is orthogonal to all polynomials of degree less than n. Yeah. So how could how could you come up with the with the construction of these polynomials? Well, um, so standard standard argument is the following: uh, the set of all monomials is going to be linearly independent in this L two space, and that is thanks to to the fact that we are assuming the support has infinitely many points. And so you can apply the, the Gram-Schmidt process to, to S and the Gram-Schmidt process will give you a sequence of orthogonal polynomials with respect to mu, yes? Um, so if you normalize, if you, if you use the Gram-Schmidt process with normalization, what you get are orthonormal polynomials. Uh, I mean, polynomials that are orthogonal with, with norm one. So, Okay, there are many, many good reasons for studying orthogonal polynomials. It's, it's a very beautiful subject. And so if you, if you are more like an applied mathematician, I, I'm sure uh, you, you have encountered at some point in your career orthogonal polynomials. And so it appears in many areas. For example, in random matrix theory, because the, the correlation functions of many ensembles of random matrices, uh, of Hermitian random matrices, they are expressed in terms of orthogonal polynomials. For example, in the case of the Gaussian unitary ensemble, uh, one uses Hermit, Hermit polynomials to, to, uh, to express the correlation function. Um, in functional analysis, Orthogonal polynomials are very related to the spectral theory of Jacobi operators because Jacobi operators are tridiagonal operators which encode the recurrence relation of orthogonal polynomials. Uh, also, toplitz hankel matrices, because such, such matrices are, are the matrices uh, of the moments of the orthogonality measure. So, and, and actually formulas for orthogonal polynomials can be expressed in terms of toplets and Hankel determinants. Uh, in harmonic analysis, you can study uh, Fourier series expansions with orthogonal polynomials. Yeah, instead of sine or cosine, you use orthogonal polynomials. In special functions, uh, they, they appear uh, in quadrature formulas, and numerical integration, they are very important because uh, as I will show to you, uh, already Gauss, Gauss and Jacobi realized that uh, if you use the, the zeros of orthogonal polynomials as, as nodes for, for um, quadrature formulas with certain coefficients, you obtain a convergent, convergent uh, scheme of integration. Um, Zeros of orthogonal polynomials, they have also an electrostatic interpretation and, and they, they have very close connection in, to logarithmic potential theory. And of course, uh, in approximation theory and continued fractions. Actually, the, the origin of the subject comes from, comes from continued fractions. And, and I'm going to show to you um, 
perhaps you know the the, the way they 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 appear in in the theory of orthogonal polynomials um, through continued fractions, and there are other connections. So um, so. So what is the, the simplest example of orthogonal polynomials? Uh, so so it, it, the, it is the, the Chebyshev polynomials of the first and second kind. So these are polynomials defined by these formulas that you see uh, on, on the interval minus one, one, because there is where the R cosine function is defined. And well, if you look at that expression, you may say, well, it's not, it doesn't look like polynomials, but they are really they are really polynomials, both of degree n. First of all, it's it's easy to see that that these functions are going to be orthogonal. Or okay, I'll show you that they are indeed polynomials. They are going to be orthogonal with respect to those those uh, measures on the interval minus one one, and. Uh, so why are they polynomials? Well, you can, uh, you can use these elementary trigonometric relations to, to establish this three-term recurrence relation for the polynomials, yes? Notice that they are the same for both families Tn and Un. And then just by looking at the formulas, you observe that T0 is just the polynomial one, T1 is x, u0 is one and u1 is equal to two x. And therefore from the recurrence relation, you obtain that all the polynomial, all, all, the, all these functions are going to be polynomials because they are generated by a recurrence relation of this kind, yes? So they are, they are indeed polynomials. And yeah, these are the simplest examples uh, one, can, one can write down. I'm going to show you um, later some other examples, but I want to say that uh, in, in this theory, you have certain special families uh, which, which have a lot of properties and, and a lot of applications. And so they are distinguished from other families because, because of their differentiability properties. And these families are uh, called the classical orthogonal polynomials, and they are the Hermit, Laguerre, and Jacobi polynomials. So the Chebyshev polynomials I just show you are particular examples of Jacobi polynomials. And so they are distinguished by the fact that they are all solutions of second order uh, linear differential equations. Uh, they are not, so, so they have variable coefficients, but these coefficients are fixed polynomials for each family of degrees two and one, lambda n depends on n. Um, these polynomials can also be generated by a difference, differential formula known as Rodriguez formula. Uh, w of x is the way uh, defining the orthogonality conditions and rho is, is some polynomial um, of degree two, I think. Um, but let me show you some examples. So, so the, the Jacobi polynomials with parameters alpha, beta, these are polynomials orthogonal with respect to that weight on minus one, one. And they are usually normalized so that the value at one is, is given by that uh, quantity there. Um, the di differential equation that they satisfy is, is the one that you see there uh, of the kind I showed you in the previous slide. And uh, so this is, this is uh, the Rodriguez formula for the polynomials, um, the same form I showed to you. And then uh, actually for these polynomials, one can uh, obtain uh, an explicit formula so you can you, you you can find all coefficients and um, so so these are of course very very well studied uh, families of polynomials. Um, now so if, if you are interested in uh, general general orthogonal polynomials with respect to an arbitrary positive measure, the most important property 
of, of them is, is the so-called three-term recurrence relation, yes? And I'm going to show you this, this recurrence relation. Uh, I show you already in the case of uh, Chebyshev polynomials how it looks, uh, but, but it's, it holds in general, and I will write it down for the orthonormal polynomials. So, so these are polynomials that are orthogonal with norm one and positive leading coefficient. So, so it takes this form. So if you expand XPN in terms of the polynomials from degree zero up to n my n plus one, you just need to you just need to use the last three polynomials in that in that uh, sequence. And what is interesting here is, is the fact that the coefficients of this polynomial PM minus one and PM plus one, they belong to the same sequence of parameters. And okay, so this, these parameters, coefficients, they're called Jacobi parameters. And so if you, um, if you express in matrix language this, this relation, what you obtain is, is a tridiagonal matrix, uh, which is called the Jacobi operator uh, with spectral measure mu. Yeah, mu is the measure defining the orthogonality conditions, yes? So notice it's a, it's a tridiagonal opera, op, operator, uh, which is self-adjoint, yes? So I want to, I want to now uh, explain a little bit uh, the, the connection uh, with the spectral theory of Jacobi operators. Um, so, so if these parameters are uniformly bounded, then, then such, a, such a matrix defines a bounded operator, which is self-adjoint in the space little L2. And so, so if you, uh, you know this way, the, the usual inner product there, and n is the standard basis, vector, you have the following interesting result. So the relation that, that maps a measure mu to the, the Jacobi uh, operator associated with mu is, is really a one-to-one -one relation between the space of Borel probability measures with compact support on the real line and the space of bounded Jacobi operators. So, so this is saying that uh, so the study of bounded Jacobi operators is really the study of very much linked to, to, to the study of uh, um, spectral properties of measures uh, on, on the real line. And in fact, the, the spectrum of, of the operator J of mu coincides with the support of mu. E zero is a cyclic vector and, and when you look at the resolving of the operator, uh, you have this relation, yes? So the, the one, the zero, zero entry of the resolving matrix is the Stilges transform of the measure mu, yeah? And, and it is this relation that, that explains why mu is, uh, is called the spectral, spectral measure for the operator J. Um, it turns out that you can, you can expand this, this function in a continued fraction. And when you do that, the, the coefficients in the, in the matrix appear in the continued fraction expansion. So you can recover the operator from the spectral measure of the operator, yes, in this way. And, and this expansion is valid for, for a, actually in the complement of the convex hull of the support of mu. Uh, if you look at the convergence of this infinite continued fraction, what you get is a rational function, uh, Qn over Pn, which is very interesting because the denominator of, of this rational function are precisely the orthogonal polynomials associated with mu. And uh, the, the polynomials QN in the, in the numerator, they are of degree N minus one. They can be expressed also in terms of PN and the orthogonality measure mu. 
And so it was Markov, Markov, the same Markov uh, from Markov chains, who, who proved this very important result that says that, uh, well, that the, the convergence of this continued fraction converge to, to the limiting function uniformly in compact subsets of, of that domain. And, and this result was really the, the starting point of, of the whole theory of rational approximation of analytic functions uh, in complex analysis, yeah? And so it, it's very interesting because, so if you continue the, the thread, you, you find more interesting facts about this, this construction. Um, so the polynomials QN, I, as I said to you, they are polynomials of degree N minus one. Uh, PN is the orthogonal polynomial. All the zeros of PN are real and simple. And uh, so you can expand this quotient uh, in simple fractions this way. And it happens that the coefficients that, that you get there, uh, they are all going to be positive. And, and this, the sum of all those coefficients is the total mass of mu. The reason why they are, they are uh, all positive is that there is an interlacing in the zeros of QN and PN, yes? So between two consecutive zeros of PN, you're going to have exactly one zero of, of the, the numerator QN. So those coefficients are, are known as Christopher functions and, um, well, so, so you have also the, this very famous gauss jacobi quadrature formula, which says that if you have any, any polynomial P uh, of degree at most two n minus one, then integration with respect to mu is the same thing as evaluation of P at the zeros of the polynomial multiplying by these coefficients and adding. So, so this is, a, this is a quadrature formula. Um, and it has a very important consequence uh, because, so if you, you apply Weierstrass approximation theory, you, you obtain that this sequence of, of discrete measures uh, are going to converge to the measure mu in the weak star topology, yeah? So the orthogonality measure can be approximated by, by discrete measures uh, using the zeros of the orthogonal polynomials and the Christopher functions as coefficients. And so I also want to, to mention uh, this, this asymptotic result because later I will show a couple of extensions of this result in the context of multi-orthogonal polynomials. Uh, so, so this is a result which was very, very famous when it was proved because it, it settled um, a conjecture of Paul Erdos uh, about asymptotics of orthogonal polynomials. Uh, but here I, I put two, uh, two dates because the original proof contained a little error which was later corrected in a, in a second publication. Um, so it says the following, that suppose that the support of the measure mu is an interval, delta, center at the point B with length 4A, okay? Where A is some positive number, right? So, so the center of the interval is the point B, the length of the, of the interval is 4A. And suppose that the random nicotine derivative of mu is, is greater than zero almost everywhere on that interval delta, yeah? Which is a very, it's a rather small, uh, mild, mild assumption, yes? Uh, so then what happens is that uh, the coefficients in the recurrence relation, the Jacobi parameters are going to be converged. So the ANs are going to converge to A, and the BNs are going to converge to B. And, and also, it's very interesting that when you look at the ratio of consecutive orthonormal polynomials, that, that limit is actually going to be a conformal mapping. This is precisely the, the conformal mapping that maps the exterior of the interval delta 
onto the exterior of the unit disk. And um, it's unique if you, uh, if you, uh, you know, assume that maps infinity to infinity uh, with positive limit coefficient. And so, so what this result says is that under, under some mild conditions, there is a kind of universal behavior in the orthogonal polynomials, yes? Okay, so now I'm gonna jump to, to multi-orthogonal polynomials. And so what I, what I will do now is I will, instead of considering a single measure mu, I will have a collection of P measures uh, where P is two or, or larger, yeah? And I'm going to introduce multi-orthogonal polynomials as solution of, of the following problem. So let's say you, uh, you pick a multi-index. So a vector n with p components, which are non-negative integers. And you want to find a polynomial pn, which is not the zero polynomial, with degree at most the norm of n, which is the sum of the components of the multi-index, such that this polynomial satisfies orthogonality conditions with respect to these P measures. And the number of orthogonality conditions are, are given by the components of the multi-index, yeah? Now, so, so this, this problem always is going to have always a, a non, I mean, it's going to have always a solution for a very simple reason. Um, these orthogonality conditions are going to be linear equations in the coefficients of Pn. Um, and you have, ex you're gonna have norm of n uh, linear, linear equations, which are homogeneous in, in the coefficients of Pn, which are un the unknowns here. And you have norm of n plus one coefficients. And so, so linear algebra tells you that that such a problem is going to have a, a non-trivial solution always, yes? But, but that's not very satisfactory because what you really would like is that the, um, that the degree of the polynomial is as, is as high as possible, yes? So you would like the degree of Pn to be uh, equal to the norm of n. And uh, in that case, you are going to have also uniqueness up to a multiplicative constant. And so, so what you want is uh, that these measures mu j are, are sort of independent of each other. So each orthogonality condition is really adding a new information, yes? Or, or, or a new, um, what you say is, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you're imposing something, something new. Um, and so, so when, when the, when the multi-index, when the, when the solution of this problem has maximal degree, uh, we say that the multi-index is normal. And when all the multi-indices are normal, we say that, that the system of measures is perfect, yes? So, so perfect systems then are, are desirable things to have because you have control on the degree of the polynomials. Yeah, and I'm gonna show you some examples of, of perfect uh, systems uh, using uh, classical weights. So, so you have, for example, the Laguerre multi-orthogonal polynomials uh, studied uh, by, by these people. Um, and so they are defined using Laguerre weights. You, you have two weights and, and the difference is, is on this coefficient beta j, yeah? So for orthogonality purposes, you need the betas to be less than zero, the alpha greater than minus one. And if you just assume beta one is different from beta two and you define these orthogonality measures and these orthogonality conditions, uh, you're going to get a perfect system. So poly polynomials that are multi-orthogonal have the highest possible degree. Uh, so they can be generated by Rodriguez formula. Um, and you can, you can also find an explicit uh, expression of the polynomials. Um, 
this is this is the recurrence relation that that those uh, like multiple thorn polynomials satisfy. And notice that now because we have two measures, uh, we are going to have a four-term recurrence relation instead of three-term recurrence relation as as for orthogonal polynomials. Um, and the differential equation satisfied by these polynomials uh, has, has a degree uh, or order one unit more than for uh, orthogonal polynomials. So, so they are of order three in this case. Um, so you also have, for example, Hermine multi orthogonal polynomials. Uh, in this case, uh, the orthogonality weights are, are defined the way you see there. Um, and Again, so these are these are polynomials of the highest possible degree, and you have explicit formulas. So, um, so the the three the four term recurrence relation takes the form that you see, um, and the differential equation uh, again is of order three and is explicit. Yes. Okay, but now uh, I would like to. Uh, to discuss with you now uh, the construction, two constructions of uh, orthogonality measures that, that are going to uh, give perfect systems and, and they can be applied for general measures, not just some specific uh, classical families uh, of weights, but a construction that produces perfect systems using arbitrary positive measures. And, Perhaps the first example was uh, produced by, by Angelescu, who was a mathematician uh, that studied in, in Paris. He, he was a PhD student of Appel. And, and in, a, in a work in early 20th century, he, he introduced what are now called Angelescu. Um, so the, the, name, the name replaces the U with an O because he, he liked to, when, when he signed his papers, give like a French version of his name. So that's why uh, we say now Angelesco. Um, so, so what is the construction he, he introduced? Simply take a collection of P positive measures uh, supported on intervals delta K. And we want these intervals delta K to be pairwise disjoint. So there is no there is no overlapping between any two of them. Yes. And yeah, and I'm assuming the measures mu k are as before. Uh, these are finite and uh, have infinitely many points in their support. That that's important. And so so he showed that when you construct the corresponding multi-orthogonal polynomials p n, it happens that. In the interior of the interval delta j, you're going to have exactly n j simple zeros of the of the polynomial, yeah. And so n j also coincides with the number of orthogonality conditions you are imposing in the interval delta j. And so, as a as a simple consequence of this, uh, well, the polynomial p n has to have maximal degree, right? Because in every you have P disjoint intervals, and in each one of them you have nj simple zeros. Therefore, the total degree has to be the norm of n. And so, so that, that shows that Angelesco systems are perfect systems. And then, okay, uh, so, so much later in, in uh, around 1980, uh, Nikishin who was a Soviet mathematician uh, very brilliant mathematician who uh, unfortunately passed away, I think when he was 40 or so. Um, he, he made very important contributions in, in uh, rational approximation. Actually, he wrote a very influential book in that area with a student of him. Uh, but he also worked in harmonic analysis, uh, by the way. And, and he, he was actually one of the the recipients of the Salem Prize in, in, in analysis. So a very, very brilliant mathematician. Uh, so he came up with, uh, with a, uh, another construction, which is more complicated as I will show to you, 
but gives rise to uh, to perfect systems. But the perfectness of of these systems was proved much later. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show to you how to define these systems in the case of two and three measures, because in general, it gets a little bit complicated uh, from the technical point of view. Uh, I just want to give you uh, the idea, yes? So, so what you do is now the following. Uh, you start with a couple of measures in, in the case of two, two measures, yes? Start with a couple of measures, sigma one, sigma two. And let's call delta one and delta two the convex hull of the supports of these measures. Uh, I'm going to assume they are disjoint. And now I'm going to generate a couple of new measures, mu one and mu two, uh, in, in, this, in this simple way. So mu one is going to coincide with sigma one. And the second measure mu two is going to be sigma one multiplied by some function. The function is the Stilgers transform of sigma two, yes? And notice that the definition is okay since I'm assuming the supports of sigma two and sigma one are disjoint. So there is no uh, singularity here when, when you are defining uh, when you are defining this orthogonality. I mean this uh, I mean possible possible singularity. I mean, if sigma one and sigma two uh, had the uh, overlapping overlapping supports, uh, then then you have a singularity when defining mu two, but that's avoided. Yes. And in the case of the case of three measures, you do something very similar. Uh, so you start with, with three measures. And what I need is to assume that delta one and delta two are disjoint, delta two and delta three are disjoint, but delta one and delta three may, may be overlapping, yes? Uh, unlike the, the Angelesco case where I needed all these intervals to, to be disjoint. So then, you, you construct now these three measures. Again, mu one is going to coincide with sigma one. Mu two, as before, is sigma one multiplied by the Stilgis transform of sigma two. Uh, mu three is going to be perturbation of sigma one by this function H three, which is a sort of convolution of these Stilgis transforms of sigma three and with sigma two, yes? And well, you have a you you already have an idea then how the construction goes in general. So we have to we have to do this kind of convoluted integrals. But what is important to notice is that all these measures, their support coincides with the support of sigma one. Yes. Uh, so they are all supported on the same the same uh, the same set. And so the, the perfectness of Nikishin systems, uh, it was it was proved uh, relatively recently in, in 2010, uh, so even though such systems were introduced in 30 years earlier by, by Nikishin. Uh, so so, so uh, Fidalgo and Lopez, uh, Lopez is my father actually. Uh, so, so they show that uh, that Nikitian systems are perfect, meaning that for any multi-index that you pick, the multi-orthogonal polynomial corresponding to this multi-index is going to have maximal degree, yes? Uh, and moreover, they, they also show that their zeros are simple. They are all simple, uh, that they are all contained in the convex hull of the support of the first measure sigma one, Remember, all measures are supported on sigma one. And there is also interlacing uh, in the zeros of, of these polynomials. So the, the zeros of QN uh, interlace the zeros of QNL, where NL is a multi-index you get just adding one to any of the components of N, yes? So, okay, so, uh, so, and like the case of Angelesco where, where the polynomials don't have always very good asymptotic properties. Um, 
Uh, Nikish systems, uh, I'll show to you at least in the context of ratio asymptotics, they have very, very good asymptotic properties. And, and I have worked on, on, um, on that subject. Um, but okay, first uh, I want to I want to explain that uh, there is a recurrence relation also uh, for for these uh, multi-orthogonal polynomials, which which is going to have a higher order. So it's going to uh, involve p plus two now polynomials instead of three, as in uh, the case of orthogonal polynomials. But since I have several measures, I have to fix the sequence of multi-indices uh, with which I will construct the recurrence relation. And the standard way is to, is to consider the sequence of multi-indices, uh, which uh, you construct starting from the, the multi-index with all components zero, and then you, you start adding one to each component from left to right, and once you have uh, filled all the components, you go back to the first one and start adding one and, and so on. You continue this way from, from left to right, yes? And okay, so I'm gonna call QN the corresponding multi-orthogonal polynomial that corresponds to the multi-index in position N plus one in this, in this sequence. So then uh, both for Angelesco and for Nikishin systems, you can show that, that they satisfy this, this uh, P plus two term recurrence relation, yes? And, and okay, so, uh, so, so if you express this recurrence relation uh, in matrix form, what you get is not a tri-diagonal uh, matrix, but you get uh, P plus two diagonal matrices, and and these are Hessenberg mat these are bounded Hessenberg matrices, and so the the study of spectral properties of H is is very much related to asymptotic properties of QN, um, <clears throat> and I'm going to show you um, uh, this this result which generalizes uh, the theorem of Rachmaninoff. Uh, now in the context of multi-orthogonal polynomials for Nikishin systems. Uh, and I'm not gonna uh, uh, give you all the details, but I will, I will simply say the following that, um, so let's say you have a Nikishin system of P measures, and I'm going to assume that the measure sigma J, which are the measures generating the system, their uh, rather Nicodin derivative is greater than zero almost everywhere on delta J. And then what you have is you have ratio asymptotics with period P. So, so when you look at the same sequence I, I uh, considered before, then for each L between zero and P minus one, that, that sequence has a limit. Uh, so, this limit is valid in the complement of delta one. And the limit function is going to be a conformal mapping. Yes, the, the, the limit function actually can be extended analytically to a Riemann surface of genus zero. This Riemann surface, you can construct uh, gluing different sheets uh, that, that you construct uh, making cuts along these intervals, delta J. Um, there are no explicit formulas for, for this conformal, uh, I mean, these conformal functions in general, of course. Uh, but, uh, okay, there are, there are different things one, can, one could say, but I'm not going to enter in, in, in details into that. Um, now, as a consequence of this formula, what happens with the recurrence coefficients? The recurrence coefficients are going to, to be also uh, asymptotically periodic with the same period P. And so, so this is what I mean by that. When you fix any indices I and J uh, this way, then, then you have limit uh, 
the, this limit with period P. So, so if you look at the, the matrix I showed before, what I am saying is that each diagonal of this matrix is a sequence that has P periodic limits. Each sequence is, is uh, asymptotically periodic with period P. So when you, when you jump P, P unit, I mean, P, P terms in the sequence, you obtain a sequence that has, that has a limit along any of these three uh, diagonals. And, uh, and so, so what, what we're saying is that my, my uh, matrix H is going to be a, a compact perturbation of an infinite tridiagonal block toplets matrix. Yes. Um, which, which you can construct this way, yes, using this, just these three blocks. And, and then uh, sometime later, uh, together with Stephen DeVoe and my father, we, uh, we obtain these relations between uh, these coefficients in the blocks. Um, and it happens that the, the limits for the first subdiagonal are going to be all the same. Yes. Uh, so, so you have this equality uh, for every J and K. The, the, this would correspond to the entries in the first subdiagonal. And then when you look at the, at the subdiagonal that is further down, uh, you have this interesting nonlinear relation here. So if you have, for example, um, this, this uh, uh, scheme here, when you look at the difference of two entries in, in this subdiagonal, that is gonna be equal to, to this entry here times the difference of certain entries in the main diagonal, uh, which are obtained uh, the, the way you see there, you know? So, so this lies in the same column as, as these two, and, and this lies in the same row as this. So, so uh, we don't know whether, whether these relations uh, somehow characterize uh, the limits of the recurrence coefficients for Nikitian systems. Um, so that, that's an interesting open question. Uh, I'm gonna check the time. Okay. Oh yeah, oh, uh, I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost uh, running out of time, but uh, so I just want to- Five minutes later, so. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. I, I, I remember. Yes. Okay. So I'm on time then. <laughs> um, so, so I want to, uh, to show to you uh, some results uh, with Nikitian systems, but constructed not in the real line, but uh, on star-like sets in the complex plane. Uh, the reason why we we look at this was uh, because there there were some. Um, direct spectral results some years ago by Aptekarev, uh, who was studying uh, asymptotic properties of polynomials generated by three-term recurrence relation of high order. And, and it turns out that the zeros of those polynomials were uh, contained on a, on a star-like set. So, so I thought uh, that it would be interesting then to to construct Nikitian systems on, on a star like said, and try to see if, if I could recover the results of uh, Aptiakarev. And, and that turned out to be the case. So, so the construction now is like this. So uh, we fix uh, an, in, an, an integer P2 or, or larger, and I'm going to denote by S plus the star in the complex plane of all points that are mapped to zero infinity by this map, z to the p plus one, and s minus the complementary star, yes? So I'm going to construct now a, a system of, I mean, an Nikitian system on s plus. So I need to tell you what are the, the generating measures and where they're going to be uh, supported. So, so it is like this, it's a little bit complicated, uh, but it's not really, really much. So what you have is uh, you're going to take some sets gamma zero, gamma one up to gamma P minus one, 
which are going to be containing S plus or minus depending on the parity of J. And so they are, they are the inverse image of intervals delta J on the real line uh, by, by the same map Z to the P plus one. And I'm going to take delta J to be contained in the positive real half, plane, half axis if J is even or the negative half axis if J is odd. And okay, as in communication systems on the real line, I will assume that delta J and delta J plus one are disjoint, yes? So this is a possible situation in the case P plus two, okay? So I will, I will take a measure sigma zero uh, supported on this star gamma zero and then sigma one supported on the, on this uh, star ga gamma one, okay? And, and so that, that's what I do. So uh, I pick an arbitrary collection of P measures, uh, gamma J supported in, uh, I mean, sigma J supported in gamma J. And, and I'm gonna assume that they are not just positive, but they are rotationally invariant, yes? And they have infinitely many points in, in its support uh, for, for uh, you know, the same reasons we do it uh, for orthogonal polynomials to ensure that, that the space of monomials are linearly independent. And then um, one can construct Nikitian systems in exactly the same way you do it on the real line. Uh, and uh, so I'm not, I'm not gonna say more, but just, uh, just keep in mind that the construction is, is exactly the same, uh, involving still just the uh, transform of the, the generating measures, okay? Um, so I'm gonna call uh, SJ the efficient system generated by the measure sigma J. And, and I have changed the, the notation a little bit from uh, some previous slides. Uh, I hope that you don't mind, okay? So, so then um, how are the multi-orthogonal polynomials defined? Uh, so because the measures SJ are going to be now complex, uh, I'm going to uh, impose the orthogonality conditions uh, not in a Hermitian way, but in a complex, complex, uh, really complex orthogonality. So I will ask uh, QN to be uh, orthogonal to all monomials of degree, well, given by this, uh, this uh, quantity here for each measure SJ in the, in the system. And uh, well, the, the degree here is not, is not uh, guaranteed uh, since, the orthogonality are non-hermitian and I'm using complex, uh, complex measures, but we were able to, to show that these polynomials have the maximum degree. And so they are multi-orthogonal with respect to the same sequence of multi-indices that I described before. And okay, in the analysis, we also need to make use of the functions of the second kind. Um, which are functions defined in a, in a recursive or iterative way, starting from the polynomial QN and the, using the generative measures. Um, the reason why we need these functions is because the, the difference equation now is gonna be of, of order P and we're going to need P solutions, linearly independent solutions of, of the difference equation uh, and, and they are gonna be actually given by the, the polynomial Q and these functions uh, of the second kind. So, so some years ago, long ago, uh, in a joint work with a friend of mine, we, we show that indeed QN has maximal degree, uh, that you have this decomposition of QN uh, modulo P plus one, so QN now is gonna have some zeros of higher multiplicity at the origin, but the, the rest of the zeros are going to be simple zeros. Yes. And, and they are going to be, they're going to have some rotational, I mean, they're going to be rotationally symmetric. 
since you have you have this this uh, decomposition formula here so you have you have some zero at the origin of, of high multiplicity all the rest are are simple and they are symmetric uh, the zeros of those uh, polynomials which are simple they interlace and as i was saying qn and these functions of the second kind are going to be solutions of a different situation uh, of all the p plus one. Um, <clears throat> and therefore, for ratio asymptotics, so I'll, I'll show you the, the result that is analogous to the one obtained by Aptekarev, Lopez, and, and Rocha. Um, so what is interesting now is that the, the periodicity in the asymptotics goes from P to P times P plus one in the context of the star-like set. So, so when you look at ratios of, of polynomials like, like this for every fixed row between zero and P, P plus one minus one, you have these limits, yes? And the same, the same is true for the functions of the second kind. And, and so for, for the recurrence, uh, coefficients, you are going to have also uh, limits with the same period, P, P plus one. Okay, uh, so, so this, these are the recurrence coefficients in this recurrence relation uh, for that, that I'm showing to you. So these polynomials, what is interesting is that they satisfy a very simple, very simple recurrence relation uh, with a lot of symmetry, but at the same time, the, the ratio asymptotic uh, formulas are much more complicated than in the, in the real line. And okay, just want to, to show to you uh, just very briefly how the, the limits in, in this case look like. So, so when you fix rho between zero and p, p plus one minus one, um, this ratio converges to some function, which, which is going to look like this. Um, and, and this function phi, phi zero L is going to be again some conformal mapping uh, that, that uh, can be defined or, or extended in a Riemann surface uh, of genus zero again, but it is composed with, with Z to the P plus one, yes? Um, and then for, for, the, uh, for the functions of the second kind, the same uh, formula is valid. You just have to, uh, instead of using phi zero, you have to take the analytic extension of, of phi zero to, to another sheet of the Riemann surface, you know? So, so one, one function is, is, can be viewed as an analytic extension of the other. Um, and then, okay, I will just show to you um, some interesting relations that you can prove for the limiting values of the recurrence coefficients. So remember we have uh, uh, P times P plus one such limits. So I'm going to, which I denote this way, and I'm going to extend that sequence uh, to, to the whole the whole integers. Um, so right. Yeah, so 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 I extend it periodically, that's what I mean, with period P P plus one. Okay, so so I have uh, this identity now. And um, so one can show that all these values are going to be strictly positive. And when you look at certain uh, subcollections of these limiting values, you can show that uh, they are these this, 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 uh, different uh, values. So for, um, for any row fix, this collection is formed by distinct quantities. You have linear relations between the, the limiting values like this. Uh, the limits can be expressed in terms of the conformal, conformal mapping I showed to you. And, uh, and also 
uh, it happens that when, when this intervals delta k contain the point zero, then you have certain relations between the limiting values of the, the recurrence coefficients. Uh, for example, if, if you know that the interval delta k contains zero, then for any, any row between these values that are congruent with k minus one, you have equality between, between those limiting values. And uh, well, so if zero is not in delta k, um, then you can also prove that certain collections are formed by listing, listing quantities. So, so when, when you study communication systems on the, on the star, like said, you, you obtain very interesting relations um, and there is still much more to do um, in the study of communication systems. And so I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I, I don't hear you, Wilfredo, you know, if you have it. Pardon me? Oh, now, now I hear you, yes, now I hear you. So, thank you for, for the talk. And actually, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, oh, because uh, that uh, was very well structured, your talk, because then you can compare the classical orthogonal mm -hmm. personal relation with the multi-orthogonal one. Uh, any question or comment? I I have a question. I mean, I, I got close at the end. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have the Nikishi system. I mean, the relate. I mean, in this result, you have that the A's are related with the C. Yeah. But yeah. At the, yeah. Right. But at the very beginning, if you go back a couple of slides. Yeah, so so uh, for Nikishin systems on, on the star, mm -hmm. uh, we have a ratio asymptotic with period P, P plus one. And, and the same thing is true for the recurrence coefficients. So oh, for each okay. row between okay. zero and this value, you're gonna get a certain limit, a row. Yes, we call it a row. And so the question is- That's the classical case. Yeah, uh, yeah. What can you say about these limiting values? And it turns out that they can be expressed in terms, in terms of the conformal values of this conformal mapping that, that lives on this Riemann surface. So, um, so what you have is that- Yeah. And I, I really didn't define the, the Riemann surface here uh, because I didn't want to add more complexity here, but um, it's, a, it's a Riemann surface of, of genus zero. So it, it's, it's uh, the same thing as, uh, as the Riemann sphere, yes? So these are conformal for maps. Me, I mean, for me, it's a lost cause. I mean, I haven't been able to understand Riemann surface anyway. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Well, yeah, you can think you can think that it's, it is topologically the same thing as a sphere, you know. So the, the, you mentioned in the case of the Ratman theorem. Yeah. Ratmano, yeah. sorry. Yeah. The fee is is non explicitly. No, 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 no. In in the case, sorry, yeah, in the case of Rachmaninoff's theorem, it is, it is because it is the, the conformal mapping to, uh, of the exterior of an interval to okay. to the exterior. Yeah, so it, it's uh like when, when it's like it's called the the Joukowsky function, the inverse of the Joukowsky function. You know, so it's explicit. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Now in in the result of Abtekarev. Lopez and, and Rocha. Now, the in general, it's not it's not known uh, how these conformal mappings are 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 uh, you know are expressed. There is no closed formula for for that. But nor in in this situation um, on the star, like said. 
But but they are they are conformal and and they have this one pole and one zero, the analytic extension on the Riemann surface. So yeah. Any other comment or question? Okay, so let's yeah. thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> so we'll be we will be very grateful if you could share your slides with us. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. sure. And I will, we can make a trade off. I, I send you the, the link for the for the talk <laughs> and send up the slides. Okay. Sure, sure. Okay, 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 Wilfred. Thank you so much. Okay, thank so you very much. Yeah? And have a Great. nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice uh, spring break. Guys. Oh yeah, for you. Okay, that's good. We have a spring break next week. Oh, oh that's, yeah, that's great. Uh, over here, I think it's uh, two weeks. In two weeks. Two weeks from, from now. Uh, yeah. Okay. Bye okay, now. Thank you. Bye bye. Muy bonita la charla. Muy bonita la charla. Ah, gracias, Wilfred. Gracias. Está bien. Muy bien, este, explicada. Está eh, bien, gracias, Wilfred. Realmente, bueno, creo que. No. Aquí está. Excelente, pues. Es, gracias, excelente. Wilfred. Yo, eh, nada, pues no. Al final, eh, pues, la, la cosa se pone técnica, ¿no? No, claro, pero bueno. <risa> pero, pero precisamente como hiciste fuiste lo suficientemente hábil para, porque claro, seguro todos ellos o algunos de ellos han visto polinomios ortogonales, pero hacer la, la conexión para poder darle sentido a lo que vas a hablar fue muy, muy inteligente. Sí, Increíble. gracias, Wilfred, gracias. Un abrazo grande, sí. muchísimas gracias por... por... No, no, Wilfred, no, oye, eh, a ver si nos mantenemos en contacto con... Sí, sí con regularidad, ¿sabes? Y este, eh, te, también te puedo ofrecer una charla general o más especializada si, si, ah. si te por, 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 por Zoom, yo encantado de la vida te lo... No, Wilfred, como tú quieras, como tú quieras. Tú tienes, tú participas en un seminario, o sea, además de, tú dices... De algún seminario que tú, en el que tú participas allá en, en, donde, en, en Roosevelt o... No, no, no. El departamento de nosotros es muy pequeño. Yo, bueno, he ido, pero tengo tiempo que no voy a, a la Universidad de Chicago, al famoso seminario de Calderón Sigma. Uh -huh. año que, porque esos son los lunes a las 4 de la tarde, entonces se me ha hecho complicado a veces eh, participar. Pero, eh, y bueno, eh, también participo en el seminario que, de, de, de oh. Gamma. 